You probably expected the Grok to speak here, and uh, honestly, I expected him to speak too. But two days ago, I inherited his talk, so um, be with me that I don't have any live demos or free accounts to give away. Uh, but anyway, it's going to be interesting. So, um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to talk about what is voice over IP and a certain kind of voice over IP, namely ZIP, the session initiation protocol, and how, how do networks look like, um, what protocols are used. Since, um, I'm basically just focusing on ZIP itself, but there are way more interesting protocols to look at. And eventually, um, yeah, some conclusions, but the main thing would ju just be uh, ZIP-based attacks. And um, what is VoIP? VoIP is generally considered really cheap, both for the, uh, for the industry, like if you're an ISP, you don't have to run uh, both a PSDN network to carry PSDN calls and your IP network. You just do your PSDN calls on your IP-based network, so you save one whole network uh, set up. And from an end-user perspective, it's cheap since uh, users just won't switch to voice over IP if PSDN is cheaper than voice over IP. Um, so uh, it's in production use today. I'm with a large ISP, and um, we're appearing with a bunch of ISPs, and there's a sheer amount of, of, uh, of users and lots of minutes being pushed per day. And in the US, they are um, the first companies who are actually replacing standard PSDN setups with voice over IP. And um, one of the interesting features is free calls. You can do free calls, like uh, free local calls in the US or probably within your, your own city. Uh, in the US, you can usually do free calls um, on a larger scale. And with voice over IP, your ISP usually allows you to do free calls uh, within this very same community, like uh, all users with, with, uh, within one domain. But um, voice over IP also, is, uh, also converges with the PSDN. So all the network uh, equipment uh, that was yeah, safe from users, like you couldn't um, really ping your PSDN gateway or do any kinds of attacks to your PSDN ga gateway, uh, but blue boxing, uh, are now being exposed to the IP network. So um, step by step, some of the uh, PSDN equipment will be replaced by uh, IP-based systems. And it's uh, growing rapidly, and it's immature. Like, um, there used to be one ZIP RFC, and it has been replaced, and there have been lots of uh, additions, and pretty much on a, on a weekly basis. There are either new RFCs or just drafts with features to replace or to build all the features that are present in the, in the uh, PSDN network, network, so they're going to be available in the ZIP network, although some of them are pretty much useless. But uh, to con convince a user to actually switch from the PSDN network to the voice of IP system, he has to be able to, to provide all the features he likes to have that he depends on. And another thing is um, voice of IP, um, even in, in transit setups or when um, talking to peering partners, it's used without TLS, so there's no encryption of signaling, uh, no kind of uh, real authentication between peering partners, and uh, you can see signaling, so who's calling whom. You can, uh, it's at some points, even see uh, real data, like voice streams. So I'm going to the, uh, kind of qu quickly to this, uh, since I've got a lot of uh, slides on the ZIP st uh, stuff itself. Um, talking of infrastructure, so what does a web system consist of? You're going to have your, your voice over IP based phone. It could look like a, a hardware device. Um, there are some manufacturers that offer like the uh, Cisco phone that you're going to see in all those nifty movies. Or you might have in, in your office. Or you can have one of the uh, AVM or, or, uh, routers or Siemens based boxes that you get with your DSL access and you just plug in an old DAC telephone in, into it. The phone you already have at home. So. Uh, switching from, from the PSDN network to voice over IP isn't that, that much of a hassle. You just, yeah, switch the plug and everything should work. And then there's a bunch of companies, uh, namely SNOM, which is a very good one from my point of view, uh, which is, they just built a, a real phone that looks like a standard ISDN or DAC phone, has most of the features, and just voice over IP uh, underneath it. It has, has a web server, IP address, everything. And um, on the other side, you can have software phones like um, software like Skype you've got on your, on your laptop when you're traveling. And one of the popular ones is, is X-Lite. There are companies uh, branding that phone and, and selling it or giving it, giving it, giving it away to, to customers for free. And in the Unix world, there's uh, K-Phone, which is pretty good. And there's some other ones uh, picking up pretty, pretty fast. Um, to make everything work, you're going to have to have 
some sort of lib software in your network. This is usually a so-called registrar. This, that's the point where all the phones sign on to, just say, okay, I'm here. And if somebody tries to reach you, he would contact that particular server, and that particular server would know if you're online and which IP address you currently have. Then there are um, so-called route or proxy servers, which could uh, divert traffic, like um, for peering purposes or some sort of, of PSDN uh, interaction. And another feature which doesn't have anything to do with uh, zip calls themselves is uh, called presence, like, like ICQ. So you can see which of your friends is currently online. So you can just, yeah, see, okay, he's not online. It doesn't make any sense to call him using VoIP, so I just call him on, on his PSDN account instead. Um, okay, PSDN integration, there's uh, two parts to that. Just talking of voice, you've got to make calls from, from the VoIP network into the PSDN network, and you have to be able to pick up calls from the PSDN network if you've got a phone number in your voice network uh, to get the call from the PSDN into, the, uh, into your zip cloud. And then you've got auxiliary services, like you have to do, be able to do billing. If, you're, if you've got paying customers, uh, you want to get their money, and yeah, you have to do billing. It's, it's kind of tricky, but you can do it, and there are different approaches on how to do billing on, on voice over IP networks. Then you've got web interfaces, like uh, change your user settings, um, see your call list, who called you when you're, one, when you're uh, not available. Then you've got uh, media proxies and stun servers just to help with net problems and all those sorts of issues. And there's a lot more to that, but this is just the basic uh, setup. So how does it look like? Um, on the left side, you've got a bunch of uh, zip clients. Could be standard soft phones or software phones. Could be an AVM box, could be some sort of, of Cisco phone or whatnot. You've got a zip proxy. And if you're just uh, doing voice over IP to voice over IP calls on using zip protocol, you just, uh, one zip client tries to reach somebody and he's just uh, sending a message to the zip proxy. And that proxy would know where the, uh, the callee is and just forwards the zip message to the callee. But nonetheless, the, uh, the real media like the voice data is just flowing between the, uh, the two zip proxies. So you don't have to have that much of bandwidth on your zip proxy to get it done. And um, then you can had, could have uh, zip peerings, like voice over IP based peerings, uh, like two different companies appearing with each other and allowing uh, their customers to call each other for free. So you're gonna have a second zip proxy in that, in that route. So if you're calling somebody at a different uh, zip ISP, the call would be directed to your own zip proxy, and that zip proxy would know, okay, that phone number you're trying to reach is connected at a different uh, zip proxy. So you just forwards on the message to the other zip proxy, and the other zip proxy would know where to push the packet to actually uh, place the call. And in addition to that, you have the, uh, the PSDN gateways, like um, yeah, zip to PSDN, PSDN to zip. Could be the same box, could be a cluster of boxes, if you're talking of bandwidth, um, yeah, doesn't really matter. So um, different to, to the PSDN network, you've got a separation of signaling and media. As I said, signaling is always flowing and all consecutive messages in the call flow are flowing from one client through the proxy to another client. There's just a few mutual exclusives where you don't have to push all the data through the proxy. And for signaling, you have uh, basically the zip protocol, which seems to be the standard right of now and it replaced AS323, uh, which used to be a standard and still in use, and there's a, some, uh, some gateways running which are translating zip messages to the older protocols and vice versa. And then you've got MGCP, Media Gateway Control Protocol. It's a nice protocol with, uh, which has a lot of security issues just to control your media gateways. So you have a dedicated box speaking zip on one side and MGCP on another side. Um, to kind of hide your, your infrastructure towards your uh, zip world. It's a nice approach, but yeah, has a lot of issues. And Megaco is another protocol, pretty much like, like MGCP, but MGCP seems to be the winner in that race. And then you've got, yeah, Skype, which is proprietary, but still a signaling protocol. And there's hardly any interaction between Skype and zip. Some people try to, to do uh, Skype with zip or otherwise, but um, yeah, we are not supporting Skype. And, I can't, I can't see any, any widespread support of Skype in any commercial zip networks. It's just another company and they are making money and yeah, you wanna make the money anyway, so there's no reason for you to, to peer with Skype. And media is another thing. Media is usually, uh, 
RTP, like uh, real media stuff, real-time protocol, and you've got different codecs in there. You can, you can do audio, you can do video. There's even a draft to do text over IP. It's called text over IP, so it just allows you to um, push data, random data between two boxes using zip signaling. It sounds funny, but it actually makes sense, since um, with zip and all the, uh, the net helping uh, stuff and, and media proxies, you can traverse a lot of net uh, boxes and, and firewalls. You won't be able to, to get through without having uh, stun in all those protocols in first place. So um, having zip and all the aiding protocols, you can, you can uh, do direct connections or indirect connections between two boxes that won't be able to speak to each other without having zip and, and stun all those protocols in first place. So that's interesting. And um, okay, just to, since I'm, I'm gonna focus on, on zip, not MGCP in this talk, just um, to get an overview on how um, the whole thing looks like if you're using MGCP. This is just zip, so if, you're, if you've got a zip client and doing a PSDN call, you're gonna have your zip client talking to your zip proxy, and your zip proxy is uh, forwarding your, your packets on to your PSDN gateway. Your PSDN gateway could be a Cisco access server, could be an asterisk, could be some sort of IP, IP speaking and zip enabled uh, router that speaks uh, some sort of PSDN protocol on the backside. And in this scenario, your zip server would have to know all the access servers that are capable of doing PSDN calls, like the load levels, uh, availability, like if some gateway goes down, your zip proxy has to know, and you probably have to reload your configuration, um, and some zip proxies don't support reloading configuration on the fly, so you have a downtime on zip proxy just because one gateway failed. So you wanna preempt that and um, might go with MGCP. So in that scenario, you've got an uh, intermediate box called Media Gateway Controller, which um, takes all the zip proxy, all the uh, zip traffic directed to the, towards the PSDN and controls so-called media gateways. The very same Cisco access servers. I'm not sure about if you can actually use an asterisk box and control it using MGCP could be some sort of gateway. And the media gateway controller just hides your whole infrastructure for the zip proxy. So it's easier to administer and, and you've got a lot of advantages like load balancing and all the stuff get, that your zip proxy can't just take care of since you can't do load balancing stuff in zip on its own. So um, this really um, is interesting, but on the downside, having MGCP in the middle is, um, is hard since um, you have to translate all PSDN features into MGCP messages and then into zip messages and vice versa just to get uh, like caller ID correct or some sort of uh, PSDN features like hold or, or call pickup. It's hard to do. And um, another interesting thing is uh, one of the uh, sections of the uh, MGCP RFC says, okay, um, we know that MGCP is insecure. Like just read that uh, sentence. Um, they know it's insecure and that's pretty much just three commands. It's create connection, it's modify connection, and delete connection. And the moment you're able to send MGCP messages to a gateway, you're controlling the gateway. You can, you can divert calls, you can create new calls for free, and at that point, you're behind all billing issues. So um, if you're directly calling the, uh, the gateway, nobody would know. There would be no billing ticket written, not, no nothing. So. Um, it's interesting to deal with that, and the Grok had a few slides on that, but I'm focusing on zip, so um, I'm leaving this, this out for this talk. So um, if you're interested in that, just yeah, get to me later on, and we could talk about that. So um, the main talk is focusing on, on zip. Zip has been specified in an old RFC, and then been uh, superseded by RFC uh, 3261, and it's still very much the same protocol. It looks like HTTP, it's uh, plain text, all the status codes are um, yeah, well known from HTTP, like 200 okay, 400 for not found, 403 forbidden, authentication required, unauthorized. There's a bunch of yeah, well known one and there's a few additions, uh, especially for zip. And it looks much like HTTP uh, 1.1 environment variables that you can set like for cookies or uh, server, server names and all that stuff. And you've got pretty much key value pairs like it's, it's the from address, to address, contact fields, and much like an HTTP, you're gonna, you could have a payload. You just say, okay, content length, that amount of bytes, and you've got that amount of bytes on arbitrary data. It could be mine encoded, could be just uh, 
media information, all sorts of stuff. But in contrast to HTTP, zip is usually being carried using UDP. Since if you're placing a call, you don't want to wait for a TCP handshake to yeah, finish, then just send a short message like 500 bytes, and then wait for the other packet in the other direction to come back. You just send a datagram, and if that doesn't, uh, if, an, if an answer doesn't come back in a few milliseconds, like 500 milliseconds is the uh, standard time on the RFC, you just retransmit the same packet. So using UDP, which makes spoofing kind of interesting and easy, because you don't have to have the, uh, the TCP handshake. Nonetheless, uh, zip over TCP is uh, generally supported. It's, it's working, although some, some clients just don't speak TCP, uh, zip over TCP. But in some scenarios, TCP might help, since you don't have to care about retransmissions. You just send a packet off, and your kernel, kernel uh, operating system underneath will just take care of the, uh, of the packet and make sure it arrives at the other side. So it's easy on that point. And then you've got TLS, it's transport, la transport layer security for TCP, which allows you to encrypt your um, signaling data, which gets interesting. But on the other side, all zip components have to be able to read your data to actually forward the call. So you have to decrypt it on every box. It might take some CPU. You ha might have to, you might run into licen licensing issues if you're running Cisco gateways and whatnot. Another interesting thing is uh, DTLS. I just came across this a few weeks ago. It's uh, TLS for datagrams. So it's uh, UDP-based TLS. So you have all the benefits you have with uh, UDP, but it's still encrypted. But yeah, probably 99.9% .9 of the uh, the setups of just using plain UDP. So um, the downside of zip. The, uh, the state engine is pretty complex. There's uh, a lot of states, and it's, you, can, you can run into race conditions uh, sooner than you know. And it's always changing due to additions. Like I, like I said, um, certain companies are trying to, to get all the PSDN features into the zip, zip world. So like Deutsche Telekom is, is trying to do all the features they have in their PSDN network. Uh, it's called uh, communication completion on busy subscriber. Like uh, you're trying to reach somebody and um, he's currently talking and you can press a, 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 a something called, uh, the German word is uh, Rückruf, just like uh, call, call back. So um, um, the, the gateway in the PSDN network would know when the, uh, the person you're trying to reach finishes call and establish a call to that person, and both phones would be ringing, and you can just make the call. But um, if you're trying to do the same th thing in Zip, it's really different. And you don't have uh, any real state engine to know if somebody in the PSDN finished this call. And even if somebody finished this call in the uh, Zip world, you won't know if, if it was a video call, an audio call, or just text transmission or whatnot. So it's hard to do, and uh, companies are paying others to get additions into ZIP, and they're publishing drafts, and they're implementing drafts, not RFCs, and um, it's hard to follow. Like, from an implementation point of view, you have to, you have to do a complete implementation. Like, usually you would um, do, the, do it the easiest way. Like, no white spaces, um, everything is case insensitive, but nonetheless, if the RFC says, okay, the expire setter should be written with a capital E, you're usually writing the, it with a capital E, but some clients are writing with the uh, lowercase e, and some zip stacks don't recognize an expire header, although it's conforming to the RFC with the uh, lowercase character in there. So um, one of the, uh, the worst stacks we've seen sent everything in lowercase, and it, was, it, it wasn't really uh, bad, but um, on the other side, we had another stack who just didn't understand lowercase uh, header names. So. Um, from other headers it passed, there was just two lines remaining from like out of 20. So there was no way to make a call between those clients. And it's, um, we are fighting on this all the time and there's uh, pretty much no way for us to do it but encourage, uh, encourage uh, vendors to write uh, stacks conforming to the RFCs and accept all different ways of, of writing. And there's uh, different ways of doing things, like route headers. You can, you can do multiple headers underneath or I can make a list and append to list. And this is really bad since um, for a zip message to find its way back to the sender, you just revert the list. But if you've got a mixed thing of a list of headers and a, a list that actually contains a list of headers, it really gets, gets troublesome. So um, sometimes packets just don't arrive at the, uh, the sender and you won't be able to make your call. 
So um, what's available in the open source world? We've got lots of uh, different stacks. Some stacks are just good enough for, for a simple client to do calls or just good enough for testing. Um, one of the better ones is uh, libozip. It's uh, really good. You can, you can write clients or you can just do simple debug applications like um, use libpcap to capture all your traffic, feed it into libozip and actually make libozip pass your zip messages and, and find bugs or just record things. Uh, exozip is another uh, library. Reciprocate is a well-known library by a company or, or federation called uh, Zip Foundry. It used to be the, uh, the first real Zip stack, and they are trying to implement all the drafts. It's kind of the uh, reference implementation. And then there's uh, libdissipate. I, I never played with that one. And client-wise, there's Kphone, Linphone, SFL phone, phone game. It's, there's a bunch of clients. Um, although I'm using GNOME, I, I still use Kphone since it's just working. Um, then you've got a lot, a lot of test tools. There's really lots of test tools available just to exploit things or test uh, things, register to a zip server, send arbitrary messages, and uh, ZipZack is kind of stateless, but still does a job if you just have to send a zip message. Uh, zip with a double P is a good tool. It's uh, kind of uh, transaction stateful. It's not really stateful, but it's still good, and you can uh, define your X, uh, own XML-based uh, configuration file and we'll just do the whole dialogue based on your configuration. That's really helpful. And then there's uh, something called the uh, Protoss test suite. It's one of the first um, attempts to actually exploit zip stacks and find uh, problems in the implementation. And ngrep supports uh, yeah, pretty much all protocols. It's really easy to do, and uh, ngrep can re is, is good to just debug zip. You can just make it uh, print zip messages. Uh, on your screen, so it really helps. Etherreal is, is nice in, in generating call flows, doing statistics on voice data, all that sort of stuff, but it's, uh, you have to have an X running to get that done, so ngrep would be the, uh, the usual tool to do administration with. Um, talking of zip servers, you've got the uh, zip express router, which is like, yeah, uh, the company behind that, Iptel, says I think they've got an 80% market share, and they're probably true about that. Uh, Asterix is, yeah, used to be some sort of PBX, uh, connecting to um, PSDN, they're having their, their own protocols, and it's, it's a good tool, but if you're just talking about zip, it just doesn't scale as good as that does right now. So um, if you're just looking for a zip server, not PSDN gateway, not a media proxy something, uh, just go with there for now. And then there's zipd, party zip, uh, vocal, has a bunch of uh, libraries, applications, server software. There's everything out there. I've got a, on the, uh, one of the last slides, I've got a link to a website that lists all, all the software and uh, has all the links to the websites. So talking about attacks, so now for the funny part. Um, there are probably buffer overflows in all devices. I, um, I expect that uh, there have been buffer overflows in, in almost everything, and um, from what we've seen, there are usually buffer overflows in most uh, even, even the, the better ones, like zip proxies, uh, Cisco gateways, clients, uh, anything. It just starts with like, um, you're converting all numbers that you might have in memory to plain text, and on the other side, you have to uh, pass that particular number and put it back into memory. And you're just writing a number that's uh, like larger than uh, two to the power of 32. And if you're trying to push that into a 32-bit 30 uh, uh, integer variable, you're gonna have some sort of overflow, which, um, regarding to the zip RFC might result in uh, negative expire times. Like you're registering a zip client to a zip server, but the expire time says, okay, my, um, ex uh, my entry expired like 700 years ago. So you can have a lot of fun with that. And then you've got race conditions. Um, zip stack is very complex, and in order to have a really working dialogue, um, before you can send the second packet, um, you usually have to, to make sure that the first packet arrived at the caller and the first acknowledgement from the caller got back to the sender, so you know the whole path. Otherwise, you might run into, into issues. Like, um, you've probably seen it, if you're trying to cancel a call, you just you punch in a number, it's, okay, it's, it's, it's a typist, so you just cancel the call, but it might, might still ring at some random phone you don't know. So that's some sort of issue. And another thing is, signaling is being pushed from your client to a zip proxy, probably onto another bunch of zip proxies, and then to the, uh, to the, try and, uh, uh, to the uh, callie. But um, if the callie picks up, he sends a message back, okay, I picked up. But at the very same point, he's starting to send media 
he might actually be sending media before he, um, he picked up your call. Like, um, if you're calling somebody on a, on a German cell phone, um, you're hearing the ringtone from the PSDN network, or some companies allowing you to um, play some custom ringtone, like the latest charts entry, what, what not. So that's so-called uh, premature media. And um, even if you're, if you're working regarding the RFC, you're connecting to a call, and the zip message that you're getting connected is sending back to the, uh, to the caller, the media, might be, uh, might be at the, uh, the caller before the first acknowledgement arrives, since media is being sent directly from client to client, but signaling has to traverse a lot of zip proxies on the way. So um, there might be issues with that. The, uh, the most obvious ones is uh, getting ICMP on retrieval messages, since uh, the UDP port is not open yet for the RTP data. But on the other hand, you might uh, be able to just push RTP data into a client, and the client just plays RTP data arbitrary audio you want the, uh, the client to play without having to actually do something. So that's kind of bad. And um, yeah, signaling. Uh, that's a so-called read and write packet, which allows you to um, change the codec while placing a call. Like you're, you're figuring out, okay, the connection is not as fast as it, as it could be. Uh, we're getting a lot of delay or something. You're just changing to um, a better codec that has lower bandwidth consumption, uh, lower delay, whatnot. And um, that allows you to change the codec, but on the other side, it still allows you to um, redirect media, since you can uh, change the IP address, the IDP traffic is directed to, or just support. And another thing is alert info header. It's um, interesting. You can um, change the ringtone. Like, um, you, can, you can add an alert info header um, field to your outgoing zip and write, and say, okay, please use this ringtone in the phone. And um, although you've mu muted your phone, some clients still play the ringtone. And one of the interesting thing is, things is you can append an HTTP URL with a WAV file that's going to be played on the customer phone. So if you want to spam voice over IP customers, it's, using, uh, it's called SPIT, you just have to put a web server up, put a, web, a WAV file on it, and just try to make calls with the alert info header. It might work. Um, Media RTP, it's, um, it's not really zip signaling, but there's lots of stuff that can be done with RTP. You can inject media. Like, um, clients are usually expecting media to come in once you're connected. But before you're connected, um, some gateways play a ringtone, and that ringtone's being, gonna be played on the client. It could be like a, um, just cost announcement, like this call is going to be charged with like 10 cents uh, per second. So that's called premature media. And um, if premature media is not used, you can play your own, or you can try to replace the, uh, the media stream that's being called with something else. Like you can obviously do that later on, but if there's no premature media, you don't have to get rid of that, that in first place. So it's easier to do uh, spit in, in premature media. Or you can do um, spoof receive, uh, receiver reports. RTP has something called, uh, it's, it's a control protocol, RTCP, and allows you to send, uh, the, allows you, if you're sending RTP media to a client, uh, the receiver report is from the receiver, obviously, and contains um, information about the quality, like delay, jitter, if there's any packet loss in something. And um, honestly, since we're dealing with so many net issues, um, most of the clients are not sending those packets at all. So um, what's going to happen if you just send RTP, RTCP packets saying, okay, the voice quality is so bad, you just, you just have to change the, uh, the codec. And at some point, the caller might say, say okay, uh, we've got 90% packet loss, uh, huge delay, we just tear down the call. Just um, it doesn't make any sense. So you might be able to tear down calls just by injecting one RTCP packet saying the voice quality is really bad. There's lots of tool to do that, and also there's a lot of, lots of tool just to um, record data, Etherreal is capable of doing, uh, yeah, is of reconstructing uh, wave files from RTP streams, or you can just um, divert traffic, so you can e easily sniff traffic. That's another interesting thing with RTP. But yeah, now back to the uh, zip side. Um, billing evasion. Um, at some point, it doesn't make sense to try to get free phone calls, since um, ISPs know how to do authentication. They um, actually have a look at what's happening on the network. But 
nonetheless, you can try to exploit the system and make a phone call and let somebody else pay, it, pay for it, or just try to shorten the call. So um, this usually has to exploit ISP-related features. What ISPs are doing in communication between, within their ZIP network is appending um, some sort of prefixes or private headers in their ZIP messages so they can ad identify a particular client or ZIP packet on another gateway. So if I want to know if some packet is coming in from a ZIP uh, peering partner, um, at my first uh, kind of firewall host, I would just check the packet it came in from a ZIP peering partner. But um, so I can later on, another host, see, okay, it came from a peering partner and perhaps not do authentication. But um, some ISPs are probably not checking if somebody else just faked that header and just appended a header saying, okay, I'm coming from a peering partner and I don't, I don't need to do authentication. So um, there are probably ways to append your own headers and um, the group had another interesting thing. They can just send your, set your caller ID just by using a private header that's not being used in any RFC. But you're still seeing the header since you're getting the zip messages back from uh, th that ISP and they didn't care about deleting the header when it left the network. And you can still try to get free calls. It's, um, from my point of view, it's getting harder and it's, it's um, not that easy to get with, uh, based on zip. But as I said, you can just get around zip and just use MGCP to get free calls. You can just create a connection and say, okay, just get me the media to my IP address. That's all you have to do. Or you can hijack equipment. Um, most of the zip hardware actually has um, web interfaces. Like if you got a Cisco or SNOM phone, it has a web interface to do the configuration. Since you don't want to punch in numbers on a, like hex, hex digits or f number characters on a dial pad, it just doesn't work. So you have a web interface and you just log into the web interface. There might be a default password or no password. And what you can usually do is uh, either just get the account information or just initiate a three-party uh, three call. Just um, make the phone, call somebody you want to call, and on the other line, call you and just connect those two. So the call would be flowing to that particular phone and that particular guy is paying twice for the call, but it works. So yeah, just um, there's a lot of Google Docs, like the, uh, these things that you just have to type into, uh, into Google to get all the IP addresses of, of uh, Cisco phones, NOM phones, AVM routers, Siemens routers, all that sort of hardware. So it might be an easy way to not look for bugs in the zip implementation or at an ISP site itself, but just exploit the phones or hijack equipment of any sort. And yeah, zip spoofing. So if you're trying to, to do free, free calls, you have to spoof packets. Uh, obviously, you have to um, spoof a to and from header field and the, the request will be, the true field will say, okay, who am I gonna call? And the from header says, okay, who am I? So that's easy to fork since uh, to, to forge since you know, you know who you want to call. The contact fields, field is just your IP address and your phone number. You have to have that and you know what, where you are, so that's easy to, uh, to spoof. But then you've got a bunch of more tags that you have to fake to actually get that working. There's a random tag which is uh, used to identify uh, one side of the call. And as you can see, it uh, could be kind of hard to, to uh, guess that one. And um, the same one still is uh, attached on the, uh, the two side. So once the dialogue has been established, you have two of those tags, which are arbitrary, random size. And in addition to that, to make it even more interesting, you've got a call ID, which, is, uh, which should contain a host part, but must not contain, or doesn't have to contain a host part. And um, regarding the RFC, you have to get all three right to actually um, match a zip message to an already existing dialogue. So you have to have the, uh, the tag contained in the, the, uh, the from header and the to header and the contact uh, and, and the call ID. But um, guess what? Not all zip stacks are actually checking for the tags. Those tags are usually just used when uh, doing call forking, probably in third party calls and some uh, special scenarios, but you usually don't have to check those and you just yeah, leave the tag uh, out or just say, uh, set something random. It, might work. Um, the call ID is still, um, yeah, kind of hard to fake, but if you're doing your own dialogue, um, it's just set on uh, call setup, and you just have to use the very same call ID during the, uh, the whole call, so just get something random and just reuse it, it just works. The call sequence is um, something to, to work around kind of uh, race conditions. 
like um, you're placing a call in dialog and then um, you're, yeah, you're, you're changing media or something, you're sending some other messages, or you're canceling the call, and just so the, uh, the zip stack gets all the, uh, the order of the messages right, um, it increments the call ID. We could start with a random value, but it has to increment. So could be done. And then you've got the, uh, the record route header. Uh, you have to have the record route header at some point if you have to make sure your packet goes the right way. But yeah, usually you can just leave it out and uh, let the, uh, the first zip proxy take care of routing the, your, your zip message. Uh, the F tag is so-called feature tag, which uh, in this case, not doesn't only look like much the same, but is the same. It doesn't have to, could be different. And you can encode features like your zip, uh, what your zip client uh, supports. So you can set a random thing, and um, I've never seen a zip call fail since due, due to a wrong F tag, so just leave it out. Um, as I said, it's, it's hard to guess all values, but luckily, not all devices are checking everything. So if you're placing a call to a zip network, to, uh, to a PSDN network, and your zip proxy might forward on a packet, but if you're changing the, the way your packet looks like um, for consecutive messages, like for the, uh, the buy or the cancel to tear down your connection, um, and just change it so your zip proxy does understand it, and your access server does understand it, or probably your access server doesn't understand it at all, or some billing site doesn't understand it, or the government doesn't understand it, it might, might be lost on the way. So you might be able to um, do nifty or exploit on that. There's lots of things you can do, like um, make calls disappear from call logs, like uh, websites and stuff, and you can try to hide from law of interception, which uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, tomorrow. And there's another thing, thing easy ex exploit, I'm gonna, I have on a, on a few slides uh, down, so just wait for that. And yeah, as I said, attacking zip servers on ISPs is, um, could be hard, but why not just attack devices themselves? Um, Cisco supports something. If you've got a huge Cisco installation in your network and you have to do a software upgrade, you don't want to run through the office and reboot every single phone. You just at night some, uh, send a zip message, say, okay, all the phones, just reboot, get the latest software, get the new configuration. And uh, the AppTrail Zip Express router actually has a command. We just have to add a contact field and make a Cisco phone reboot. Uh, it doesn't work on all versions. At some points, you have to have a TFTP server or HTTP server that has some version information saying, okay, the version of the, uh, the firmware that you're gonna load is newer than the, the version you already have running. So to actually convince the phone that it has to reboot and reload configuration. But um, it works in most cases. And um, AVM, a, a yeah, well-known German company, selling lots of DSL routers, um, has everything much like, like Mozilla. Mozilla supports everything, but doesn't have a kitchen sink. So um, on the very same, same approach, somebody um, in a forum wrote, okay, the AVM box now supports everything, USB, wireless, everything, but it couldn't fetch my beer. So um, what AV AVM did was uh, you just have to punch in dash 96 star six star, and it will dis display a term called beer horn, like get me some beer in your ISDN phone display. So um, there might be some more stuff of that within the, the firmware, and it's, it's running, the box is running Linux, so you can just use strings to search for more of those. And at some point, it might be interesting to try to send uh, some of those commands from the zip network and probably um, place a call to AVM box and um, then replace your caller ID with Beerholen, so nobody would know who's calling. So there's lots of stuff to do with uh, DSL routers. Um, call ID, one of, one of the most interesting things um, Grok uh, mentioned, um, you're usually identified by your from uh, tag, like um, the call is from in some so-called display name, it could be a, a real alphanumeric name, like my name, or it could be your phone number in some random format, and your zip URL, like your phone number you got, from your, you got assigned from your ISP. And you've got something called remote party ID. It's some sort of authenticated ID. Usually your zip proxy appends a uh, so-called remote party ID, which is your phone number, um, which is supposed to be displayed if you're doing PSDN calls, or if you've got some sort of uh, zip device that supports remote party ID. It's an old draft, but most clients do support this. 
You can also do um, some of the uh, PSDN features already with remove party ID. Like, okay, here's my phone number, but you can append a flag saying, okay, but don't display this on the PSDN side. But nonetheless, it would be carried into the PSDN network so that like law enforcement agencies or like your um, police department could see your phone number or the fire department. They have to see um, who's calling. So it could be still be carried into the PSDN network. And one of the, the, uh, the uh, later one, later approaches is uh, called peer and identity. It's uh, two RFCs that actually date behind the latest uh, zip RFC. And that really deals with authentication. Um, if you're appending a peer asserted identity header, you have to make sure, you have to assure the identity of the caller and, and all those things. But if some ISP doesn't support the latest zip RFC or anything that came after the latest zip RFC, he might not uh, support peer asserted identity. He might never have heard of that. But you can just append the peer asserted identity header to your zip messages. And the zip proxy would not filter that out and send it on to the uh, PSDN gateway and probably make the PSDN gateway display the number you wanted to display in all parts of the, of the, uh, the signaling. So just play around with that. Uh, as uh, the group found out, you can uh, set a header so, set, uh, called set caller ID and make newphone.net display a random caller ID that you wanted to display without having to set uh, from remote party ID or peer certain identity. And um, one interesting approach that uh, German Spiegel picked up a, f a few weeks ago was um, just spoof your caller ID from a zip-based network and call some random German phone or some random German um, cell phone. And since you're coming, you're, you're spoof the, uh, the number you're spoofing would be the, the, the phone number you're calling. So on the PSDN network side, you're calling your own cell phone mailbox, your own voice mailbox. So you're being authenticated. Since you're calling your own phone, you want to listen to your own mailbox. You don't want to say anything, but you want to listen to the messages re previously recorded. So you can circumvent authentication just by faking your caller ID. So um, that's an interesting approach, and it works. So um, as I said, that's an easy ex attack ex example just to work around billing. Um, you're the caller, and um, you're placing a zip call using the zip, zip proxy to the PSDN, and somebody is behind the PSDN. And, um, the first message you're sending is actually making it all the way through the zip server to the access gateway. The call is being uh, set up. You've got voice flowing, everything, everything is fine. And then you send a, a cancel message or a buy message saying, okay, I want to terminate the call. But um, you've got a so-called max forward setter. It's much like a TTL in uh, IP and says, okay, that message previously kind of looped somewhere through the network and it expires on the zip proxy. So the zip proxy would still uh, record that the packet arrived and record in the database, in the billing, okay, um, the call is being terminated. And um, it might make it to the access server, but then the access server would say, okay, it's expired. Max forwards is reached. I have to throw the packet away and would keep the call open. So you can just shorten your calls. You would still have to pay for the call, but you can just shorten it. And as of today, there's no way in, uh, or no easy way in the official zip so, uh, source code to check for minimum value of max forwards on your first zip proxy. So this really makes sense to play around with. And um, webinfo.org has a bunch of uh, zip-based billing uh, setups. And if you just look at the mailing list and see which kind of companies are posting on the mailing list, you might see which kind of company is using which billing software based on the zip proxy. So if you're sending the, uh, the max forward setter, which is too low, and you're doing a PSDN call, you might yeah, pretty much uh, ruin their, their billing and get a longer call, for, not for free, but for cheap. So um, talking about RFCs, um, there's so many RFCs, but there's one website that tries to pick, uh, keep up with all the incoming RFCs, not the drafts. And this really makes sense to look there, since they've got all the information about every, anything related to ZIP, like uh, media traffic, um, net tapping stuff, and everything. And uh, iptel.org is the website of the uh, ZIP Express router. They've got a bunch of links. And if you're looking for open bugs, um, just look at Cisco. Um, Cisco IOS supports uh, ZIP. They've got a bunch of other ZIP-enabled equipment. They've got more coming up. And um, just use your CCO account and just see what's going on there and what's wrong and what kind of funny behavior some people saw in the, in the past. And just see if you can yeah, actually use that for your own purposes. 
And as I said, wipe.info.org uh, wipe has a bunch of interesting um, just lists of zip software. So for your operating system, just a zip client, uh, debugging tools, zip stacks, and how to get started. Onzip.org has a bunch of lists just for the uh, zip express router. But I think it's kind of interesting since um, zip express router is probably the uh, zip server you're going to deal with if you're doing anything zip in, in Germany or probably in, in all over the world. So that's usually the, uh, the first zip server. So knowing that um, makes it easier to actually see what's, going, what's really going on. So conclusions. Um, web is emerging and it's being in use and people are replacing PSDN setups with their own web systems. Their company is running uh, voice over IP and especially zip based uh, phone systems instead of traditional PSDN systems in companies. And um, so now it's an interesting point where you can actually access PSDN hardware that had been in place for like 20 years and it's probably some sort of IP enabled but nobody actually had access to that kind of hardware before, since it was hard to, to yeah, send some sort of um, signaling messages over your phone line. But now you can actually play around with all the hardware and all the, uh, all the applications like voicemail, billing information, media proxies, everything that's in use, and law of interception is another thing. And TLS is hardly used, and um, it should be used even more, but from an ISP point of view, you have to have some hardware to actually do all the encryption and decryption, and it just takes some time to get it done. But um, if you're setting up your own stuff, yeah, have a look at uh, TLS. And I've been focusing on ZIP, but MGCP is interesting. You don't have to deal with ZIP and billing and everything else, and probably not with uh, law of interception if you're just using MGCP directly. So have a look at that. There's even um, MGCP-based uh, end-user phones, like hardware phones. They're just speaking MGCP, so you don't have to have zip. Yeah, so that's it. Any questions? <laughs> hmm? um, okay, the question was uh, how much SRTP actually helps. Um, SRTP is, is, is a good approach, I think, and there's lots of things you can, you can do. You can um, just change your SDP information in your zip invite to some random uh, codec. And if somebody tries to intercept your call, he might see some random unsupported codec. So that's, uh, using something that's not standard uh, RTP might help in um, finding lawful interception things and other things. But if you're using SRTP, you're, and you're doing a PSDN call, your PSDN gateway has to understand SRTP and it has to do decryption of SRTP and encryption. And if you're running internet issues, your media proxy has to do SRTP. So it's just a huge amount of overhead on the ISP side and that's probably the reason why ISPs are not pushing SRTP. But it's, it's still a good approach and um, from an end user point of view it should be used. Okay, thanks for your time then.